Hi everyone, I'm Benedict Hobson, uh, Chief Content Officer at Dezine, um, and I'm here in our London studio, uh, broadcasting live. Um, today we've teamed up with uh, office design brand Steelcase uh, and architecture firm J. Mayer H uh, on this talk today, um, which will be exploring um, the impact of uh, COVID-19, what it means for the future um, of the office, uh, and how we can design better office spaces as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, so joining me from Berlin, first of all, um, is uh, J. Mayer H. founder, Jürgen Mayer H., uh, and partner at the firm, uh, Hans Schneider. Hi guys, how are you doing? Very good. Yeah, Hi. Thank you, hello. Hi, ben. Great, and from Munich, um, from Steelcase, uh, we've got uh, Divi Schombeck uh, and Vanya Misic. How are you guys doing? Hi, good afternoon, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, it is um, absolutely baking hot in London. I don't know how it is in, in Germany. Um, so excuse if I have a slight um, kind of sheen to me, um, but it is very warm in here. Um, great, um, so you guys will all share some presentations, um, but before we get started um, with that, could each of you just uh, briefly introduce yourselves, explain a bit about what it is that you do. Um, Jürgen, we'll start with you if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ben. It's a great opportunity to talk to you about um, the future of work uh, places and having uh, an, uh, an idea how collaborations can work. We are a cross-disciplinary architecture firm in Berlin, and so that's in our in base uh, in our basic kind of uh, network and structure to actually reach out and do these kind of explorations with other people. We are about 30 people. Um, the office is 25 years, 30 years old, um, and we work in all scales from small scale um, objects all the way to urban planning schemes. And you could set the project we talk about today was a fantastic um, project to really show our capacities on all these scales. And um, this is what we talk about today. And this is Hans, my office partner. We are three, and Hans is um, also the project architect for this uh, EGIS Head campus. Yeah. Great, thanks, guys. Uh, and Divi, what's your role at Steelcase? Yes, uh, maybe a couple of words uh, about Steelcase as, as well. Um, we are an insight led research and consulting company. We're also the, the market leader in. in um, like space and furniture solutions and uh, we're really I think driven by a human-centered design so our aim is really to create environments where people feel well in where people can work productively and and really perform at their best and um, my role um, here uh, in Munich is I lead the workplace design and consulting team so what do we do? Uh, we engage with our clients and uh, really um, identify their organizational needs uh, in terms of the process, how are they organized, what is the workflow, and in terms of culture, like what's the, the communication style, the hierarchy, and then translate that into um, space, customized space solutions. Great. And uh, Vanya, how does your role at Steelcase differ? Hi. Yeah, so my role is a more internal based one. I'm a UX uh, lead uh, in EMEA and in APAC. Um, I'm doing here mainly design and strategy. Um, and we are at the core of the user centered design approach here within this organization. We are doing lots of research, done lots of research now over the last one and a half years around COVID. So we'll present you a bit, a bit about that. But also we are informing product development uh, with the research, um, new strategies within Steelcase, and of course, new business solutions that we are also developing within Steelcase. Great. Um, and um, uh, Devi, I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about the relationship between Steelcase um, and, uh, and JMARH? Yes, so uh, we were really excited to be pulled into this project. So. I think the contribution majorly from the Steelcase team was that we were able to bring in our expertise in new ways of working. Um, we help uh, organizations uh, globally in their transformation process and really um, consult them on how they can leverage their workplace also as a strategic asset. And um, this is, I guess, how IGZ uh, also came to us and um, we were able to, to engage in this project and uh, really go into this uh, 
interesting co-creation process with Jürgen Meyer Ha, the architect, and IGZ. Yeah, so you guys work together on a, a new building for, for IGZ, that's right? Exactly. So our part was really the workplace strategy, the workplace concept, but of course built on the platform of the architecture and, and uh, concept of uh, Jürgen Meyer Ha. And, uh, and yeah, together with IGZ, we, we basically created this uh, in alignment. Great. Well, that, that probably leads us on quite nicely to Jürgen and Hans to, to take us through this project from the architectural perspective. Um, and then uh, DV will, will come to you to talk a bit more about the workplace elements to that. And then Vanya, I think we'll also hear from you a, a bit more about um, the kind of strategic reports that Steelcase do and the kind of trends that are kind of um, fueling this design and, and kind of related to it. Um, so um, Jürgen and Hans, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, if you could give your, share your screen now to give your presentation and tell us a little bit more about this, this project. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we work on all different scales, but at the very heart of our um, kind of engagement with architecture and space is, of course, to look at the, the limits and the, 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 the limits of the discipline and see how our uh, current tools, digitalization, sustainability really transform the way we think space, we design space, and also how it's produced. Um, when we were asked by EGZ to think about the extension of their campus, uh, because it's a really fast growing company that uh, provides a software for uh, logistics mostly, it's an invisible tool um, or an invisible product that has to be somehow experienced, represented in its quality and its integrity, um, basically with the places where they work and how they produce um, their, their fantastic products, which is uh, these logistics softwares. Um, so we were um, asked to think about how this culture of working and the, and the growth of the company uh, that started in this very small town um, uh, at the Czech border in Bavaria is now you know, really rapidly growing. And um, there's a certain history that starts with the barn, which is somehow the legacy of the company and translates these um, kind of traditional elements of uh, this very small town, uh, Falkenberg, into uh, an array or a series of buildings that kind of grow as the company grows. So what you see in the foreground um, is this little fortress um, that stands on a huge granite rock. You don't see really the height of it because you're looking down. There's a small river running through the village. It's about 700 people who live there and it's a, it has a very strong community um, feel and bond. Um, so the company really is dedicated also to strengthen um, the region, to strengthen the economy and you know, to contribute to the, let's say the wealth and the prosperity of that area. So there is fantastic food, you know, it's beautiful landscape, hiking is uh, great, but also the expertise of these kind of hidden champions that you find all over Germany, this is one of them. Um, and of course, it's not so hidden anymore because with these buildings that they produce and the first three buildings were done by Brückner and Brückner, which is also a you know, very kind of grounded uh, and uh, internationally known architecture firm from that area, um, they began with like three buildings and ours is the fourth in a larger expansion of that um, campus of EGZ. You'll see that on the background um, and if you zoom in, you see the three buildings um, the first one on the lower left side and then the two next ones, which all show somehow the way they work in this kind of 12 people groups or units. And that's also echoed and shown in the structure of the building. So this was basically the starting point when we um, were asked to think about how this could extend or how this could be actually developed and um, change and uh, how to evolve for the future. And our building takes part of these units, um, but then becomes a more integrated network um, interior structure and with more flexibility that you will see later also when we look into the interior spaces. We changed also the orientation of the building um, because it's at the top of that little hill. And so the views are going to a different direction. Also the north south um, orientation of the rooms were kind of replaced by an east west, which is somehow also better for the climate and the light conditions um, inside uh, for the working spaces. 
Um, they're all connected with a long kind of passageway with, with bridges in between. So ours is basically the fourth one, but now becomes the main entrance to the campus that will also, I think, in the future further expand um, with the company's growth. We have the main building and the main entrance now with this new one, the fourth one of this uh, group of uh, office buildings. Um, and you see the units, but they start to become somehow networked, integrated, uh, and these diagonals are partly a structural um, component. Uh, they are also stiffening out the building and they become shading devices with these boxes uh, when the timber facade is applied on it um, in, uh, in a later stage. Actually, you know, what you see now as uh, the, the, the facades around the building. They also, um, of course, echo somehow the history where, you know, uh, where the, the buildings are coming from, from the barn, you know, over these kind of modular units, timber construction as a modular timber construction and so forth. And we worked very intensely from the very beginning with BIM models, so modeling and integral uh, planning with all different forms of HVAC, structural services, etc., um, helped us to think about this project from the very beginning in a very super efficient way, um, um, also in relationship to cost, to sustainability, to um, building time, um, designing time. We got the building promotion within a very short time of a couple of weeks. And the building from the very first sketch to the final moving in took about two and a half years. So it's extremely fast uh, uh, and really well coordinated. And the whole communication with the client, um, but also then later on with all the companies and uh, engineers involved, including Steelcase, um, they all worked really so um, well together that um, the timeline was actually key to the project, but not uh, forgetting about the quality and the innovation that we can bring with it. Maybe I think it was kind of pushed by the speed and by the, by the urgency of the project. So even the central hallway in this case, which became or becomes the social hub now in the main entrance, all these built-in furniture, uh, which kind of a softened version of the structural um, idea of the building is all modeled from the very beginning with all materials, with all kinds of uh, technical requirements and so forth. And this is then how it was fused with uh, the structure and uh, playing around the diagonal um, structural elements. It's all also in material connection to the surrounding and to the area we have a lot of granite, you see here a granite floor, which are these kind of um, small units uh, adding like a public plaza. Then we have um, the timber, which is oak from that region and um, concrete as kind of also a reference to the um, kind of stone, uh, yeah, the stone and, the, and the, the kind of the, I don't know, the, the granite culture of, of that area. This is the main access that when you come from the existing buildings, that's how you would enter the, the central hall, the social hub, also the welcoming area um, for, for visitors. But also this is from uh, kind of uh, the place where people would hang out and, and meet and this becomes yeah, a place uh, for communication between all the different units in the building. You then also find a stair um, that is leading up to the third floor, and this is becoming a, a, another sculpture element inviting you to really um, experience the building and find also shortcuts within the different levels of the project. It's just some other views. Um, the detailing and the precision also of the companies who executed it was extremely um, extra, uh, uh, ex extraordinary. It was fantastic to work with them. There was a knowledge and a, um, also a, a craft um, a kind of sensibility that um, was very special that you don't really get with a lot of projects. Even in the 3D modeling then of the workplaces, we have social areas, as you see here, we have these stairs that connect between floors. Of course, the working areas are more around the outside, but the interior really becomes a flexible zone of um, cells for you know, private conversations, for telephone calls, meeting areas, communication areas, and so forth. Um, just another view. And we will hear more from Devi and Vanya later, you know, how that actually transformed and evolved from the working units in the existing buildings to now a different way of flexibility and adaptability also for future ways of working. Uh, then here, um, what's important is also that with these diagonals you, that you see from inside, you kind of 
understand when you're inside the building and uh, the way uh, you know you're connected to to that campus. Um, so the diagonals are not really blocking your view, but they're actually helping you to understand the shell and the envelope that you're working in. And uh, then, of course, also the views to the fortress that anchors you back into um, the whole area. Some views also from the interior, which are not necessarily the workplaces, but communication areas, um, relax zones, um, different forms of other offices, uh, offices that can either hold larger meetings like this one. And we don't yet have the furniture on the terrace, but it's basically a mirroring on the outside, uh, an outside room that ha doesn't have glass walls. But this is also because it's in the south of Germany, a little bit more available than uh, in other parts of Germany where the outside climate really allows you also to enjoy that um, exterior for working moments. Then uh, another way of creating different ways of working. Um, and this is all, I think, further explored later with uh, Devi and Vanya, where you have more intimate areas to work and uh, the furniture for that uh, and the equipment, uh, more flexible elements that you can roll around and reconfigure. Um, also meeting areas that are connected to working and uh, a way to also change positions and changing um, the, the way you work within one space. Um, a social area with a kitchen. So there are also other facilities um, that are offered, um, even like a gym, because the company really wants you to uh, have more experiences in, in, in enjoying the building uh, beyond the working hours, um, creating a kind of a social life also within the people who work there. Um, so that's what we see also from the outside. Actually, the gym is on the front uh, of the building on the top floor, it's lit. So it's also a sign actually to, I think, people who drive by that this is a place where it's not only about working, it's about socializing, it's about leisure, it's about sports, it's about uh, a dynamic way of um, uh, work, not working, living with your colleagues. And um, all that goes back then also to the social hub that you see again here from um, the main entry hall. This is what it will be. And with this, I would like to hand over to I think Devi, right? You can tell us a bit more how this involvement from the former work configurations then turned into something flexible for the future. Great. Sure. Thanks, Jürgen. If you can stop sharing your screen, and yeah, sure, we can we can head um, over to Devi if you can share yours. Yeah. Try that. Yeah, looks good. Okay, then I'll continue right away. Thanks a lot, Jürgen, for really highlighting this outstanding architecture. So um, as Jürgen said, I will talk about the workplace concept of this, the furniture uh, concept that uh, we did. And um, I also want to talk about the underlying design principles, because I think what's really striking about that is that the the trends and that the needs that we addressed with those have really accelerated through this COVID situation. So the principles are not necessarily completely new, but they have gained so much in importance um, through the pandemic. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a bit about this co-creation process that we went through with um, IGZ. Um, I think for them, this new building really gave the opportunity to rethink the way they work, to you know, also maybe go a step beyond that and start sort of a transformation process. And this is how we uh, engaged in this process and sort of went through a needs identification a journey with them, uh, with you know, uh, engaging with the leadership, learning about the strategic goals, um, talking to the users in workshops, in, in service. So we really learned a lot on how their current status, how they work and what the aspirations are in the future. And why I'm showing this image also of our learning and innovation center in Munich, where we are located right now, Vanya and me, is that was also one step of the journey, a co-creation workshop here at the link I think which also helped experience these new ways of working. And um, this is also sort of a prototype, ongoing prototype for us, where we 
test and validate uh, the research and new products and applications, space applications, and um, where they could also sort of see what, what would work for them and, and whatnot. Um, so talking about this building, I think this really um, was the perfect platform. It provided us with the perfect conditions for a highly flexible workplace strategy. You know, this really modular and open space uh, loft-like landscape um, really provided a canvas for a great amount of freedom where many different uh, work modes can, can happen. And uh, basically the first design principle I would like to address is that we need to create a fluid environments versus fixed environments. Like historically, architectural offices have been built for permanence with the built-in walls with fixed installations. And what we already saw before COVID is this high need for flexibility. And that was also something that IGZ addressed with us that they really want to pursue a more agile way of working and they want to have this uh, high amount of flexibility. So um, the sort of interior system that we used for IGZ is the flex collection. And the flex collection really is a kit of parts um, that is designed for agile work. And the, um, yeah, the speciality around this is that it's highly uh, lightweight, it's, it's modular and it's, it's mobile through the wheels. Um, so the benefit is, as you can see here, that you don't have just one space, but you have multiple spaces and the team itself is, is able to reconfigure the space on demand. Uh, they can really scout the environment and, and adjust to what was also a topic for IGZ, like shrinking growing team sizes depending on projects and are very uh, variable by that. So um, about um, IGZ, uh, this is now um, a team space uh, where you can see how this flex collection was applied. I think what's also interesting is that we had a pilot space beforehand where they were able to test it. I think a, a team of like 10 people over two, three months to really, um, to really try things out with this flexible system and, and to sort of confirm whether this makes sense and would really support their agile ways of working. And only after it has been validated and confirmed, it was sort of rolled out over the campus. Um, so the original intention was really to, to have this sort of vibrant collaboration in the teams but uh, what was something that was basically now a, an extra benefit is really for IGZ that now with this flex collection, they were really able to bring back their people after COVID in a safe way. Because um, as you can imagine, this uh, topics of distancing, of having you know, these modular separations, of being able to change the geometry so people don't have to face each other, that's something that's uh, very easily done uh, with this uh, flexibility and help in this post-COVID situation. Um, I think the, the aesthetics, um, the architecture and the interior concept really ties in well with the product design of this uh, flex collection. You also have those diagonals, um, the dynamics, um, but also those sort of humanizing round shapes and I think uh, Jürgen touched on this drive of IGZ for, for precision and detail. And um, I think also Flex comes with this high value proposition with you know, the haptic experience, the soft touch that uh, really reflects that in, and of course the, the ergonomics. Um, another principle that's um, important is that we need to address the me and the we, so um, the individual needs of employees um, as well as the teams. Um, some people believe that after COVID, you know, we can do all the focus work from home and we only come to the office for team activities. But actually our research shows that um, some people simply don't have the conditions at home to focus. 
And uh, also, you know, we as humans, our brains and bodies are not really wired to um, brainstorm eight hours in a row or like collaborate eight hours in a row. And then the next day you focus at home eight hours in a row. So we will still also in the future need both in the office and we have to be able to switch quickly between focus work and teamwork. And um, Jürgen touched on this. So when you look at this very um, active and collaborative team space throughout the project, you always have these possibilities, the offer of secluding yourself from the team and, and having different levels of privacy according to your individual needs, like a completely enclosed um, room in room solution, but also these semi enclosed uh, focus booths to, to have this visual privacy or acoustic privacy and also to signal to your team that maybe right now I don't want to be disturbed. Um, and now with um, yeah, most companies also thinking about a hybrid model and uh, working from home being uh, something quite normal, um, we have to create spaces that brave the digital and the physical. So you have like a, a seamless and an easy integration and, and uh, like an equal uh, uh, sense of belonging also for people who join in remotely. And you can see that uh, also here, uh, the meeting spaces are well prepared. You know, you can, it's easy to bring in remote um, employees in the meeting room or clients, you can share content easily. So um, this is already uh, in a good place at, at IGZ. And maybe the last uh, element that I would like to highlight with IGZ is um, that I think social hubs have become more important um, through COVID and I guess all uh, companies that uh, work in a competitive environment um, and that have to innovate are really now drawn to bringing their people together in one room where they can exchange ideas, where they can build on each other's uh, ideas to, to innovate. And um, I think this has become even more important to create these um, really um, compelling spaces where people come together. And uh, yeah, IGZ has this, especially after, you know, having worked from home and maybe being in isolation for a long time, people are longing for this sense of belonging and community. And I think this is something that uh, IGZ um, is very strong in. They have a strong sense of, of community and belonging. And I think with this, you know, highly attractive and inspiring architectural piece and and this um, their, uh, vibrant uh, collaborative environment, they, they really make it easy for their employees to, to come back and to want to come back to the office. And you can see like here, this looks like a, a modern living room almost, you know, you can have like a more um, formal uh, meeting at the conference table, you can have something more loose uh, in this lounge area. And I think to allow for these different types of communication that's uh, really well done. So I think um, maybe to, to close this, I think um, the, the true power of, of this project is that it's so resilient that it's highly flexible. So this transformation process that um, is probably ongoing, um, the, the building builds the platform that um, the workplace concept can still evolve um, now in this post pandemic situation, but also uh, in the future. And I think right. talk, talking about future is probably a good bridge to Vanya. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, DV. Yeah. Um, um, Vanya, before you share your screen, I just thought I would maybe just talk a little bit about the, this, this project a little bit. I guess to give people some context, Jürgen, you said the, the whole project was about two, two and a half years from the first sketch to completion, and it completed last year, I think. Is that right? W when did it open? At what point were, were we, was the pandemic upon us at that point, or was it just before? Well, I think you're on mute, Jürgen. Yeah, sorry. I hand this over to Hans because he was uh, really completely immersed in the whole development of that project, so he knows all the details about that. 
Yeah, I mean, it was really built really right when the pandemic was at its height and it opened in September last year. So it was really what Davy said. It was like the people were coming back to work like really slowly and it's still happening. The building is quite empty yet. Uh, you can see it also in the photographs. It's all a little empty still, but they are coming and they are really happy there now. Yeah. And and obviously, when you were designing it, you would have had no concept of what was what was to, to come. Uh, has there been anything like, obviously, you wanted it to be flexible, but uh, opening in the middle of the pandemic, uh, were there any surprises? Did you have to change anything? Did, um, did things turn out differently from what you ex were expecting? I mean, actually, Davy said it already, that it was from the beginning very important to have a very flexible building and also to have these open spaces. And so it was kind of very easy to adapt. It was more like the distance between desks and things like that that were easy to, to, to make. And so it was not really a big of a problem, bit of like a real problem to, to solve that. What was really more important was in the beginning, that's maybe something we can talk about later, how we really developed it together. I think this was really special in this project that also the client took the time um, to have someone that is specialized on furniture and us as architects and put them together in a team with them. They are really a very um, um, professional client. So they also knew exactly how they want to work and what they need. And to really do workshops just on that topic. And uh, I think that was pretty special in this project. Usually the furniture simply comes afterwards and it's not like right from the beginning that we think about it. And here it really started right from the beginning. Yeah, well, maybe and, maybe and now's a good time to talk a little bit more about that, actually. DV, go ahead. Sorry, just to, to build on, on what Hans is saying, I think what, what was also uh, really helpful was this openness to, to do this prototype, the, the pilot space where you could already, uh, you know, have some feedback and maybe small adjustments so that then the inhabitation of the of the project was not such a big surprise, but they had already sort of had the first, uh, you know, findings through through testing and we were able to react to that. Yeah, and let me say that was also important for other topics like the acoustics, for example. I mean, the biggest issue the client had in the beginning was that it, these open spaces wouldn't work for him because the, their workers really have to concentrate because they program things. And so um, that was something you can see on the ceilings, always these acoustic panels. And we had also a very um, a special um, engineer for that who helped us um, to find solutions for that. So this, uh, this pilot space was really important, um, not just for, for the furniture, but for everything, that everything works together perfectly. The lighting, the acoustics, the furniture, um, and the materials, and of course, also the visual aspects. The client also always had a very high visual um, um, idea on how things should look like. And that's also something we discussed before. Um, like you see here, it is very flexible, but still they are engineers. It also looks very clean and the colors are really clean. So this is also something that we kind of could develop in this space. I wanted to ask you about that, actually, about um, whether there's any kind of conflict between creating a, a super flexible space and one that's kind of architecturally striking. Because um, I noticed, especially in the entrance hall, you've got quite sculptural um, furniture, you know, the, the, the wooden furniture and that, that kind of very impressive staircase. I imagine like the most flexible spaces would be a kind of a blank rectangle, I suppose. As architects, how do you kind of um, bridge the, that, that, that difference, that gap? I think that's when the diagnosis come in again, uh, where you create an identity, but not within the space, but actually on the facade. Uh, and you, you know that you're part of this overall envelope of um, diagnosis and network um, connections of stairs that go up and down. Um, so the, the, that, that was part of what you experience when you come to the main hall, but it's always echoed um, in every room that you are because you find these elements by looking outside. On the other hand, um, uh, we have uh, the, the same kind of uh, glass partitions that allow you to have visual connection at the same time acoustic um, separation. There's also a partition walls with the same timber that you have with the elements, uh, the sculpture elements in the main hall. 
it's uh, it's it's a flexible space, but within the material integrity of the overall and continuity, uh, basically through the whole building, um, you have a framework that allows you to be kind of elastic when it comes to configurations of space. And this will go on. Um, this building actually was the first step to also just think into a different way of office culture and um, office working. Um, it's something that also the next generation of uh, the uh, you know the, the clients uh, family like uh, is coming in so they also bring in different experiences from outside so it's really evolving and we had a chance uh, you know with steel case and with the client to really think about what are the static parts of that development and which are the elastic ones um, that can be constantly changed and, and discussed and evaluated and and Hans, you were talking about the the, the integration. So you, you as architects, um, but having the furniture wasn't just brought in at the end. There was a real conversation, and you talked about the acoustics. What enabled that to happen was that uh, having a good client. Um, Jürgen in the presentation talked about the uh, kind of extensive BIM modeling that that you guys did. Was was that a factor? Is it technology that's allowing this kind of integration where there wasn't before? Yeah, I think it really helped like the 3D. So uh, you can also imagine it the way that we had a 3D model with the furniture and we could give it to the client. He could see it on his iPad and walk through the space and discuss it with his employees. Uh, we couldn't talk to every employee, of course, but um, he could show it to them and then we would get um, um, yeah questions or whatever so I think the, the technology helped a lot and then also all the furniture from Steelcase um, there were 3D objects that we could easily put into our our plans and our 3D files. So, I think that's an important aspect that it was not just a communication between the planners and then basically the people who are working in the space are confronted with a certain result they were also part of the process um, they were part of, you know, even like the chairs they would you know choose and, and see and some of them are um, more elastic the others are a little bit more stiff according to you know, their economic uh, requirements or needs so it was a process uh, where uh, it was not a top-down decision-making process. It was involving, you know, all levels um, of the company's, uh, yeah, personnel basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and and oh yeah, go ahead, sir. No, just saying, you know, for us, of course, it's always a great thing if we can be involved early on because it takes time to do these analyses and to to discuss with the users who will, you know, in the end be there and and work there. And, uh, yeah, what, what uh, you're also saying is that um, to involve the employees from the start on, of course, in the end, will have a much higher acceptance of uh, this, this new concept uh, than if you just put them something in front of them and, and they should adapt it. So it, it's, a, it's a perfect situation and a perfect setup to be involved early on. Great, uh, lovely. Okay, um, uh, Vanya, we can uh, hand over to you. We might c come back and touch on a, on a few of these points later, but um, Vanya, I'll let you um, give your presentation now um, to sure. talk about some of the um, the trends um, that this project okay. demonstrates. All right, I hope you can see everything. Yeah, it looks yeah. great. Wonderful. So yeah, one of, um, maybe also to starting a little bit, um, what also Steelcase does, one of our mis missions is actually to unlock human promise. What we mean with that is that at the core of our work and any work that we're actually doing is user-centered design. Um, one of the examples that you have seen here is also that we do a lot of co-creation. We do that with our customers, with our clients, with architects together. Um, and we are also doing that within our organization. What we've done in the last, especially one and a half years, is to look very deeply in how um, our world has changed. And we created one of the key uh, reports that we've produced in the last couple of months, uh, Work Better. You can have a look at it on, on, our, on our website um, and see uh, very specific trends that how they have evolved and how they, what, what implications they have brought. The way research at Steelcase um, is used is often through um, our portfolio strategy. We, in, we bring in um, new insights into our product development process. Uh, we develop also new service offers. Um, and we also pilot um, with customers together opportun on opportunities. And of course, we are also building uh, within our organizations new strategies so that also our employees 
um, have uh, the experience of uh, changing environments, but also that we are learning with them together how the future of work will look like. So one of the things that you hear heard today quite a lot is that we talked about um, digital transformation, uh, braiding in digital and physical spaces. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, what are those trends um, that we have seen. Um, those trends that I will present you to you in a second um, are not necessarily new, but through COVID they changed um, in form. And I would like to give you a little bit of an outlook what that actually meant. So one of the things that we've uh, seen over the last five, uh, five years is the topic about employee empowerment. Um, within Steelcase, what, what we often talk about is the choice and control, meaning that we want to give uh, our employees, but also our customers, the opportunity um, that employees can choose the spaces they want to work in. That means that they have enough spaces for meetings, for collaboration settings, for focus moments, um, and for even one-to-one -one, uh, conversations and reju rejuvenation um, possibilities. What we experienced in the last couple of months um, also is that people worked more from home. They experienced a different type of flexibility that um, nowadays they actually want to have that also in the work environments. It's an increase of flexibility and choice and control. And I will show you in a couple of minutes what that actually really means. Another topic that I just mentioned is the digital transformation topic. Um, we do all experience uh, a range of different channels that we're using, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Telegram web, multi-channels are uh, absolute norm in our day-to-day -day business. What we are still challenged with are situations and scenarios when we have colleagues here in the office, but also colleagues um, in distributed um, team sessions. Often the voice, the sound, the video doesn't work all, all together very well. And so what we are seeing here is an evolution and expectation to braid, as Davy said earlier on, the technology into the space. We are still researching and developing new concepts and ideas, but what we can share with you today is that we are trying not only to have more flexible furniture, but braid it in technology in order to less toggle with the technology that you have at hand in order to be faster to your meeting or have basically the flexibility to adjust while you're talking. The other part that we've seen very drastically um, changing is the authentic relationships and transparent leadership uh, styles um, that we've observed with our customers together. One thing that I still remember when I was talking to one of the customers, they said, well, they are not now in the office. How do I know how that, whether they are working or what are they working on? So what had it to happen was that there needed to be an increase in transparency and an increase in trust from the sides of the manager, but also from the side of what people were working on and how they're working. We saw more spaces in the back of how people were living, but at the same time, there was also a certain invisibility what was happening after the meetings. And so uh, companies started to um, think about what strategies in order to bring actually employees into decision-making within and to help them understand what are the challenges of COVID and how it actually impacted the company. So another aspect that we saw um, is the topic about well-being. One of the things that we saw um, early on is that we talk a lot about um, ergonomic um, of furnitures. We've got, for instance, in Germany, very strong worker councils that do take care of employees. However, this is a new era, and this era showed us as well that mental illness increased even more than it did before, and that there is a new sensitivity and understanding of well-being. The well-being has to have an inclusive, holistic approach, and that, that goes beyond only spaces, cultures, and dimensions, and we do need to address all of those aspects together. Um, here's an example um, to show you also what we saw in uh, the last couple of months. Um, we identified five different personas and all of those experience they are working from home um, scenarios very differently. We had, for instance, the isolated Zoomer, an autonomy seeker who loved to stay at home, 
who didn't want to even actually go back to work. And so, of course, companies were asking us, what are we going to do about those autonomy seekers? How do we bring them in? What can we give them to uh, feel even the same comfort as they feel and flexibility as they feel at home? And then we've got, we had the creative, creative networker. Those were also in particular challenged because they were used to work with people together very closely, whether it was in collaboration sessions in agile environments or whether it was in a face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. And then uh, for some, maybe you, you have experienced that as well. Uh, we experienced the overworked caretaker. Having family life and working life side by side challenged um, people tremendously. They had to switch between tasks and activities very, very quickly. And at the same time, the pressure of work didn't necessarily reduce. And then the last one is the self-preservationist. This person, um, what we've observed was in particular someone who already had a bit of a challenge within the organization. They loved to stay at home because that was their safe ha haven. So all five of those personas you can imagine have had their experiences of work from home and had also specific aspects that they actually were missing working in, in the office. And now I would like to share you a little bit uh, what that actually means. So when we are thinking about a hybrid work strategy, we do need to consider a couple of things. So we ask just in general questions like, what is your current and desired degree of mobility? We, are, we have seen a range of organizations wanting to move completely into the hybrid world, meaning that they want to have a mix between workspaces and home offices or even organizations that wanted to completely reduce work environments. So every organization has to reconsider what they wanna to offer to the employees. What type of employees do they actually have? What are the job functions? Do, are they suitable and can they sustain those work environments from home? What do, does an organization also need to provide in the working from home setting? Or what do they need to bring in that people have experience in the work from home scenario into the workspace? This, for instance, is an example um, of our flex um, solution that you've seen also early on with iGate uh, set. Um, what you see here is that every uh, participant has the opportunity to adjust their spaces, their heights. Uh, we um, placed new screens on that can come closer so that everybody is in an equal state um, so that we can communicate easily instead of having maybe just one vision of one space and um, one small screen of one person further away. So in, in order to have an equal state, that's one of the keys. Another part, um, what I've mentioned earlier is about authentic relationships. This is now an example um, that we have made uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago where COVID was not necessarily yet the case. Um, and this example showcases our leadership space we changed uh, the space environment in, in such a way that leaders didn't necessarily have their closed um, office environments, but they chose to work in the open so that they can connect faster and easier to employees and have also moments where they could just have a chat uh, in order to quickly solve certain aspects that they couldn't have had a time early on, or even just you know connect uh, to people around them. Um, when we're talking about well-being, there are a range of different implications that we now have also even more to um, address than before. One of them is, for instance, the privacy options, uh, the privacy options. So what that means is that in a working environment at home, you had a little bit more privacy. You could choose the way you wanted to sit, you want the way you wanted to, to see certain things, and often uh, you were alone if you potentially were not necessarily the overworked caretaker. The other part is also that you want to be very close to your colleagues and the me and we environment should have an, an easy and light transition uh, phase where you can also move from, I wanna be by myself for a moment and wanna get that task done. But at the same time, maybe I wanna hear what's going on so I'm not too far away. And the same goes also with the acoustics and the visual privacy. Sometimes you just want to be by yourself. And Davy earlier mentioned that as well, we are not, um, we are not machines, we are still humans. And so we need to humanize also the space in such a way that we can um, manage our privacy in moments where we want to have a bit of a space away from everyone. 
Another part that is really important and has increased in importance in general when working and designing workspaces is options of rejuvenation. Here, this is an example, again, from the link where we are talking about the uh, work cafe. Um, what we also generated here is not only the possibility to rejuvenate yourself uh, with a nice cake, but also at the same time, having the possibility to meet uh, people that you may maybe don't meet on a daily basis because you are not working closely together in a department. But during coffee, you can get to know each other and uh, get to know the company a little bit more. Um, Jürgen also mentioned earlier on that this was a really important aspect also for the EGZ. And um, maybe also just also to close up and close the loop of the presentation. This is an example of the gym. Um, what is really important in general is that the organization understands its DNA, understands what is really important for the employees and addresses the multi-diversity of employees in such a way that they can co-create solutions, whether it's about well-being uh, well or hybrid strategy together and ongoingly. So that's from my side, Ben, um, and I would love Great. to close the lovely picture from the EGIT set. Lovely. Thank you very much, Vanya. If you stop sharing your presentation yes. now. Great. Um, fantastic. Um, Vanya, from your perspective, when when we talked about the, the, the pandemic um, earlier, and obviously that is the context in which all of our conversations about everything are happening right now, but I think office design is particularly pertinent. When the pandemic started, everyone was saying, uh, the office is dead, people will be working remotely forever. Uh, more recently, it's been the opposite and people have said, nah, remote working doesn't work, everyone's going to be going back to the office. Uh, what do you think the, the kind of long-term impact of the, the pandemic will be on, on office culture, on office spaces? Right, yeah, so I think that's, that's also uh, going back to my, my closing words, it's definitely about the organization. What type of organization are we talking about? How have they worked before? Was there already a st strategy for people working already one or two days um, at home? And what are the supporting mechanisms that the organization is providing for people to work from home? Of course, there's also this um, part of what type of roles does the organization have? How much do they have to work with teams? And what are the digital tools that are provided actually to, to sustain a long distance and distributed work? So there's a lot in it. It's about process, it's about culture, it's about space. What are you offered in the organization as a work environment space, but also at home? It's not an easy answer, but I do believe that every organization has to address those topics or this topic in particular and find very tailored solutions towards their employees. Yeah, you, you showed uh, some of your, your slides, you were talking about the importance of integration of the digital and the physical, the kind of hybridization of the workforce of, of the workplace. Um, do you do you think that is the kind of long term future, this, this hybrid um, state? Or, or are we going to, you know, slowly, everyone will stop getting used to working from home again, and we'll kind of regress back to everyone mostly being in the office? Is, is right. that kind of is that hybrid? Some, you know, 50-50 or two days a week in the office, three days from home. Do you think that's a, a realistic future for a, a, a wide number of, of, of firms around the world? Yeah, so I think we are right now in the transition and every time um, we are really trying to dig into the topic of hybrid work, I, I I'm, I'm, uh, have to mention my design director who's saying, well, I do see hybrid work as something that is a stage of movement. It's not gonna stay as it is right now, it will evolve and we are in the stage where things evolve very fast and, and rapidly. And for every organization, that means something different. Some, it means they will completely remove the, the, the working environment. For others, it means that they will increase the working space because they realize how important it is to meet and be together. But maybe there's going to be this flexibility of giving people more the choice and control of staying and being wherever they want for focus moments, for moments where they actually have to put their down the heads down and work on something very specific. Whereas meeting in an, in an office environment is about culture, it's about creating, creating things together to stay innovative and competitive for the business. Um, and um, Devi, you 
in your presentation, we're talking about the kind of extensive consultation that you did with um, with uh, with the company, but also with the employees. Um, there have been a, quite a few stories of, of maybe a, a slight, uh, just in terms of this back to the office question, a kind of disconnect between maybe what employers want and, and what employees want. Uh, I'm thinking the, of, of the Apple campus, there was quite a high profile story about employees complaining about being asked to go back to the office, essentially. Do you, do you see any kind of difference in, in what the employees want and what the employer wants and, and how, when you're designing office spaces, do you take all those potentially competing factors into account? Um, yes, I think, uh, of course, you know, as Vanya had mentioned, you know, there's different personas. So you cannot say the employees or the organizations on one hand, because there's very individual needs. Um, I think what, uh, what we have to do in the office space is to provide the conditions that sort of bring out the best of the home office so that it's not just, you know, now you have to come back to the office, you know, because we want you to, but um, ideally people want to come back because they see the purpose and they see that they can be more productive in the office and that they have better conditions there and that they feel well there and that they also maintain the good things that they experience in their home office, um, that they can also see that reflected in the office space, like, for example, this autonomy seeker, you know, to have this freedom. Um, right now I can work on the sofa, I can work in a cafe. Um, how can we translate that to an office space and maybe offer more diversity where maybe the reality is most uh, companies still have mostly workstations and some meeting rooms. Is there maybe, you know, a, a larger array of different um, uh, applications, different work modes that you can address in the office. So you also, uh, Vanya mentioned this choice and control that you can really um, make your choice and, and still have the, the freedom, um, but you would rather do that in the office because you see you see your colleagues there. Can I, can I jump in? I think this is a great point that you made. Um, and you're talking about home and work, but there's this whole space of commuting also, um, where, you know, for some people it's 45 minutes, uh, one way to work and home. Um, and now even, you know, some companies in Germany are offering the commuting as part of the working hours. So, you know, if the, if the equipment in the car, you, know, you might actually have a conference while you're driving, if that's safe, or you sit in a, in a train um, that allows you to maybe write something and concentrate there. So all these kind of um, changes of uh, productive or maybe, um, uh, let's say, concentrated work, or maybe even like being in communication because with other people, because sometimes a distraction helps you to actually jump into a different idea. Um, it's not only the seclusion and the concentration that is creative. Sometimes it's better you swim or you run and all of a sudden, you, you know, your brain works in a different way. So um, I think this means that we have to understand working and, and productivity in a completely different way. And the flex collection and being flexible also means that the furniture changes because now it's equipped with different forms of electricity, with connectivity, with media that can be done. So it's not only the configuration of um, uh, or, or the, uh, the condition of these different work situations, but it's also the product itself, the furniture itself that's changing. So we see that on all levels um, from our body, you know, you have your earplugs on, we didn't know them a couple of years ago, and now all of a sudden uh, we have this white thing hanging out of your ears. Um, it's something that really goes in all scales. And this is the exciting and challenging moment. But since I remember I studied architecture, every generation said, it's such a difficult new time. You know, we have challenges that we never had before. I mean, it seems to be a rhetoric that's happening. We just have to understand that society is evolving and technology is evolving. And um, we just have, you know, we have to be curious enough to make that work. Yeah, I, that, that kind of leads on to what I was going to ask next, which was, um, you've all talked about obviously this project in particular was started before the the, the pandemic um, it was designed flexibly so it, it's it's performing uh, well um albeit it's early days um but do you do you think ha has anything fundamentally changed by 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 covid uh, or, or is, is are we just seeing a kind of continuation of, of ideas that were happening already uh, that will continue to happen has, has it has covid changed anything in terms of office office design kind of may, may, more yeah in the future 
maybe I can I can give you a little bit about that. I think it has accelerated the expectations, especially from employees to be able to control and to choose where they work and how they work has accelerated tremendously. Uh, we saw a slow, uh, steep growth of, of the choice and control that employees wanted to have and the diversity increase of um, bringing their authentic self into, into the work environment. And through this acceleration of experiencing such a different world, working from home day by day, having to toggle with the technology that might not have worked for the company that, that they worked in, um, create a different expectation, created a different dexterity of technology knowledge. Nowadays, people know what white digital white, whiteboards are and how to handle them. Presentations over Teams, Zoom were in the beginning quite cumbersome and challenging. We know all how this works. And if you're thinking about that speed that we have experienced in that end, and we are, uh, we are thinking about how quickly other things might evolve, Things will change just faster, and we need to be very easy, very great in adapting and solving solutions for a diversity group of people that are obviously coming to the office. So what we are seeing is just a faster, you know, a fast evolution of many solutions. Yeah. And and from from each of your different perspectives, whether that's from the kind of more of the office furniture kind of side or from from the architecture side, how how where, how do you guys see your role in in that? like changing because of these changing circumstances and how do you ensure that um like you know Jürgen was talking about it's not just about the office but it's about the car or the train it's the home it's like everything's more interconnected how does that change your your roles your your industries and um, the way that you work with each other um in terms of um yeah the projects that you deliver well, maybe one thing I can point out here is also something else. Before COVID, we saw our project more in working in, in rural areas, in the countryside. And this is maybe something that also really changed. Suddenly, these areas are not second uh, or not as good areas anymore because you don't have to go there every day. You go there just maybe two or three times a week or something. So they become more in the focus, I think. Um, so... Um, for us, it was new to build something like this outside a big city. And I think this will become more part of what we do in the future in, in other areas that are maybe not that um, in, in focus because I have other advantages. And um, yeah, maybe that's something I just wanted to add to that field. Yeah, no, maybe it also fitted so well to this COVID thing because um, it was kind of what happened then and it was a little bit by chance that it fitted so well. Yeah. And, 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 and maybe something, um, maybe also, you know, in terms of, of the roles or the, yeah, our profession that we're doing, I, I think what we've done uh, in the past maybe is like really, you know, finding the perfect solution for a client. And it's like, you know, you, you analyze and then you customize and then that's, that's exactly the, the workspace that works for you. And I think um, now we can see that, it's it's like an ongoing you know evolution and and we are um, really in the loop of um, creating a concept uh, working testing validating adjusting and so it's almost like uh, like a fourth dimension of the space because it's sort of an ever ever changing ongoing project yeah um Jürgen and Hans how do you as architects which architecture being something that's traditionally very very permanent how how do you deal with that that flux how, how do you need to change your approach to to the way that you you guys work I think Jürgen said it already I think it's, it's still it, it's not a it's not for us a problem because um, we have this envelope that is of course permanent but then we create flexible spaces within this envelope and that can change and that can be adjusted and it, you can actually really see it in this building quite well in the beginning these um, these uh, elements or these 12 people groups were very strong and you could read them in the interior like um, that was the idea and then when we continued they kind of uh, disappeared and it's more an open space but the structure of the building is still the same uh, so um, I think that that's really was the aim to have something that is permanent but that allows um, the interior and uh, the way it's used to change well what we also see is that there's change um, that happens not only because 
it's an architectural idea, but it's also an idea of how uh, society you know, uses its public spaces and also its buildings. So um, to have the ground floor as a social space is something that you know we see over and over. The rooftops and outdoor areas become part of buildings that are really desirable. If you are allowed to do that, for example, Berlin has a restriction of how much uh, roof space you can actually use, but still, you know, it's there's a need for creating more open air possibilities within the working environment, and especially also in housing. And if you are in quarantine, I think this was one of the most valuable assets you could have is like an outdoor part, a balcony, a garden, maybe a roof terrace. Um, at the same time, of course, um, dealing with materials that create a certain um, environment that you feel um, home uh, in or that, that's comfortable, you know, that has a kind of a warm a tactility uh, that you know, makes you kind of feel that you're in a healthy environment is really important. So I think that expectation also changes. And um, it's, it's, it's something that doesn't really only stop where the building envelope stops. Um, we see much more bicycle culture now also in Berlin, um, Copenhagen you know, or in Amsterdam or maybe on the front uh, of this development, Paris also. Um, but only these you know, things were possible to introduce into the mobility uh, network of Berlin because there was COVID. Um, and that's also accelerate, uh, accelerating certain developments. So parking is not a requirement necessarily in Berlin, but car park, uh, bicycle parking is a requirement in, in Berlin. So this is also a completely different way of looking into how the infrastructure um, is handled and uh, makes the city alive. And maybe also to, to add from the experience design perspective, um, what, what will it evolve and how will it evolve? Um, from an experience perspective, you often talk in a day in a life and what are the action points and the touch points that you are crossing when you're providing a service? I think when we're thinking about work, and at least that's kind of the future that would I that I would love to see um, is that things are happening in a more fluid way. They should not be talking about I'm going into the car and I'm working there. I'm stepping out of the car and going into the office, but rather that it is a smooth transition from one point to the other, and that it doesn't feel that I have to switch off or turn off certain things, and that my my mind can flow from one thing to another and doesn't stop me um, doing the activity that I actually want to do. And by that also closing um, maybe is to humanize also the environments. Like I think all of us have mentioned, whether it's from the material perspective, whether it's from you know, the environment that you're creating and designing, but also humanizing the technology that we're using and integrating into our solutions, whether it's furniture or spaces is absolutely the key. Um, because right now what we are experiencing at the day-to-day -day business is that we are still toggling with cable and that things are not always as simple as we would like to have them in order to actually do the job that we are doing. Yeah, and I, I guess also uh, it, that touches on, on on something that Jürgen was talking about, and I think Divi mentioned as well. Um, one of the things that a lot of people talk about is the importance of uh, just the sociability, which is something that that people have have have, have really missed. Um, do you guys, is that the future of the office is it, as a social space, like Jürgen was mentioning, rooftops, reception area, that the, the working core becomes smaller and smaller, uh, and actually it becomes more of like a, a public space or a, a, a private space, obviously, but for people to come together? Well, that's when you want to get people out from their home, you know, you have to offer something else, and this is meeting people, like being a social um living being uh, and to kind of celebrate that and allow that exchange happening in, in social spaces i think is um, is something that we cannot uh, forget and which maybe becomes even more important at the same time we want to explore our individual needs um, but that means that in these moments of coming to work uh, you really have to kind of intensify that relationship so you can actually you know who you're bonding with while you're working from home or online or remote mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, from all we know right now, I, I think we do see a shift in like ratios where uh, we get from, you know, more workstations to um, more areas where you can actually collaborate and socialize also like work cafes is the classic example. And I think what we can provide then in the office environment is that you have sort of maybe this cafe feeling in this cafe atmosphere 
but at the same time it's fueled with performance so you you can sit in the cafe but you have always access to power and uh, you always have something that supports your ergonomy so that it's actually better to be in the office and to to have those social spaces but that also allow for productivity and i think this th these are then the triggers that will make people want to come back um, in the office environment Great. Thank you very much. Well, we will actually run over time by about 10 minutes, but that feels like a suitable point um, to, to end the conversation. Um, thank you so much for your time, um, everyone. Um, I hope that everyone um, enjoyed watching it from home. Uh, the talk will be available to, to watch on Dazeed on our Facebook channel um, afterwards if you want to go back and watch the talk from the start. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.